Good afternoon, and welcome to Learning to Listen in Troubled Times, a conversation with Ernesto Pujol and Aaron Levy. I'm Leah Anderson, the Executive Director of the Stavros Nayarcos Foundation Padilla Program, one of the co-sponsors of today's event. SNF Padilla serves as a hub for civic dialogue in undergraduate education at Penn, where we facilitate opportunities like today for students to develop the knowledge, skills, and ethical frameworks to be informed, effective, and engaged community members and leaders in society. Through SNF Padilla designated courses, events, an undergraduate fellows program, and collaborations with many other campus entities, we seek to integrate wellness, service, and citizenship through dialogue. When we think of dialogue, or when I think of dialogue, uh, we often focus on ourselves talking. That might be the first image that comes to mind. And when we think about effective dialogue, we might think about strategies, about what we might say or how we might say it. And we do this in a really laudable effort to improve the quality of our connections to others, especially with those who may in some way be different from ourselves. Today, you're invited to set aside the question of what should I say or how do I say this? And to instead ask, how can I listen? Through the rich experiences of our guests, we'll explore the ways in which attentive listening can provide an essential foundation for meaningful dialogue. I'd like to thank many of the people who made today's event possible. We're very grateful to University and Weizmann School Technology and Room Support staff for helping us manage uh, the dual delivery format of this event. And we're really grateful to have so many here with us today and many of you watching uh, virtually online. Also the entire SNF Padilla staff team attended to many details um, that made this experience seamless and pleasant today. We're of course also really grateful to be co-sponsoring this event with the Center for Experimental Ethnography and especially uh, Deborah Thomas, the director, and with the Weizmann School of Design, uh, especially uh, Professor Jackie Talston. So at this point, I'm delighted to hand the microphone to Professor Deborah Thomas, the R. Jean Brownlee Professor of Anthropology and the director of the Center for Experiential Ethnography. And she'll be moderating the, today's exploration of listening. Hello and welcome. It's so nice to speak to bodies in a, in a room. Um, I'm here just to say welcome to you and also to introduce our guests so that we can get to it and get to the conversation. Um, social choreographer Ernesto Pujol designs durational group performances as public portraits of peoples and places under threat. Pujol choreographs immersive cultural experiences across vast expanses crafted with elements of walking and stillness, silence and poetic gestures. Pujol is the founder of The Listening School, a series of pilgrim workshops that explore the psychic archeology span of human creativity, training artists and citizens in listening skills for social practice, seeking the creation of conscious culture. In 2020, he launched the Savage Gardener Studio in partnership with the Conservation Trust of Puerto Rico, seeking to decolonize ecology through native and edible gardens of cultural memory. Pujol has served as a consultant for the New York State Council on the Arts and the National Endowment for the Arts. He has received rewards from the Joan Mitchell Foundation, the Paula Krasner Foundation, the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation, the New York Foundation for the Arts, Art Matters, and the Academy for Educational Development. He is the author of Sighted Body, Public Visions, Silence, Stillness, and Walking as Performance Practice, and Walking Art Practice, Reflections on Social Paths. His essays, interviews, and profiles have been collected in Buddha Mind for Contemporary in Contemporary Art, a lived practice, Fernwe, The Spiritual in Art, and Dewey for Artists, among other publications. He did his undergraduate work in humanities at the University of Puerto Rico, has an MFA from the Art Institute of Chicago, and resides now in San Juan. 
uh, Aaron Levy is a senior lecturer in the Department of English and the History of Art here at the University of Pennsylvania, where he has taught since 2002. I didn't realize that. He also teaches for the School of Social Practice and Policy, the Weizmann School of Design, the Perlman School of Medicine, and the Barnes Foundation. A longtime advocate for the healing potential of the arts and humanities, he is the inaugural director of the Health Ecologies Lab and the Social Justice and Arts, um, arts Integration Initiative in the School of Social Policy and Practice. He's also special advisor for Health and Humanities Initiative at the Penn Medicine Academy, director of the Penn Medicine Listening Lab and co-director of RX Museum, all projects and initiatives that reflect his dedication to the medical humanities and the development of new approaches to listening and care. Um, Aaron is also the executive director and chief curator of SLOT, a nonprofit organization and network he founded on the university campus that engages the public in multifaceted dialogue about topical, cultural, and social, socio-political issues facing Philadelphia and the world. And with a network of university and community collaborators working in solidarity, he has supported the development of hundreds of public programs that elevate stories and histories of the struggle for justice in Philadelphia and beyond, and testify to the power of volunteerism in the public sector. Prior to Aaron's life in the academy, he was a poet and a visual artist. He received his PhD from the School of Fine Art, History of Art and Cultural Studies at the University of Leeds. So how this is going to go is that each of them is going to give a brief presentation. And then the three of us are gonna sit up here and I will engage them in some conversation. And after a little while, we'll open it up to you and those of you who are live stream watchers. Um, and then at about one o'clock, we'll wrap up so that those who have signed up for the workshops uh, can attend them. And if you haven't signed up in advance, you can still go. I'll say more about that at the end of the event. All right, let us welcome Ernesto. I'm, I, um, I usually write my notes and I will follow them, but as I was coming here this morning, thinking of the title of this workshop, of this conversation, listening in troubled times or to troubled times, I was thinking of the magnitude of that, travel times, troubled times is a global statement, you know, and we try, we try now more than ever to listen to globality, to the world, to what is happening in many cultures, um, societies, countries, continents, islands, but to some degree, it's impossible to grasp all of it at all times. And so my question to myself and to you this morning is, what constitute your troubled times? What is your troubled times? Is your troubled times the killing of African-American men by police? Is your troubled time the kidnapping of women rights, women's rights by um, a state, a court? Is your troubled times the fight for trans rights? Is your troubled times the fight for public health in the middle of a pandemic? And I think it's very important to define what constitutes troubled times for you because that's what will curate your listening. That's what will make your listening real, not a platonic, a conceptual, a theoretical entity. Out of a class, a seminar, a workshop, a degree, but out of the life you live on a daily basis, the reality of your talents and skills and limitations, of which I have many, um, so that answering that question for you is very important. And it's something that I think we'll speak about in my workshop this afternoon. So I wanted to start with this text, which is the West is existentially organized around the Carthesian principle. 
of anchoring being on individualism and platonic thought. I think, therefore I am. But there's no reference to others or to place in that Western foundational statement. However, much of the world anchors being collectively on grounded interpersonal experience, on perception of self with people in place. I perceive myself and everyone, therefore we are here. So what if our foundational principle was, I listen to you, therefore we are here. We see, smell, taste, touch, listen and move, therefore we relate and inhabit. We are somewhere. Yet the West colonized everywhere, pri prioritizing individual disconnected thinking over perception of group and place, which is also to say over the messy feelings, emotions and passions naturally generated by being together in place. It created a hierarchy where anchoring thinking on anything other than individual research was considered primitive. Therefore, to seek to listen is not only to undo decades of Western colonialism, but to reclaim the fullness of our human animal identity. Listening to self, people, and place, to me, is true being. Um, is there a way to get rid of the top of the slide, perhaps? Sorry about this. Can you grab it there? Perfect, thank you. Let me see that. And there we go. Thank you so much. It's good to be chaperone. Um, so I've been interested in um, in listening for decades, really, and a number of projects, the gays in Portland, an intervention on the waterfront where um, individual um, artists um, forming a community um, for that morning, um, coming together and letting go of individual narrative and just becoming group um, and inviting others to look at the water. Um, Not moving. Maybe it needs the okay. That's okay. It's good. Um, speaking in silence um, in Honolulu, a project in cooperation with the Native community to revisit the city of Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, visiting historic neighborhoods. Um, that the native people feel are invisible to most tourists uh, who see a commercialized Hawaii, a Hawaii of spectacle and entertainment. Um, nine to five, more art, sponsored by more art in New York where a group of 11 uh, performers sat to listen and see um, an immersiveness in perception, the flow of a city and write about it non-judgmentally. And then uh, around 2015, I came to this premise that historically art has communicated messages and audience have read them. Artists have spoken and the public has listened. But what if we turn the tables on art? What if audiences voiced and art held their voices? What if the public spoke and artists listened? What if artists were public listeners and art served as a tool and vessel for listening to humanity? And so as of 2015, I developed the Listening School project that usually culminates after a series of workshops and immersive experiences in listening to a city in what we call the listener's performance. And we have done two editions of that in Germany um, and in New York. Um, the listeners in Germany happen at the town hall of the city of Osnabrück co-hosted by the Kunsthal Osnabrück, the Theater Osnabrück and Labor Europa, 
for Culture Night, the Peace Festival of 2019, just before COVID, commemorating the 370th anniversary of the Peace of Westphalia Treaty, which saw the end of the war between Catholics and Protestants, where one sixth of the German population died. The, um, so this was the site of listening, the town hall, the medieval town hall, reconstructed after the Second World War of the city of Osnabrück. And these were the listeners. Um, we trained um, a number of citizens, some artists. Um, I like to make an open call to a city uh, through universities, schools, libraries, uh, foundations, um, any institution that partners that we can partner with and engage uh, civilian citizens who have no artistic training but, and will give me therefore the body of the place. Um, as a social choreographer, I'm trying to draw a portrait of place. And so it's very important for me to engage the body of the street, not only the body that is graceful and trained, but the body that is plump and walks um, untrained. Um, and so this was the group um, and this was the site. This was actually the site where the treatise um, of Westphalia, the piece of Westphalia was signed by the very men whose portraits you see on those walls um, 370 uh, 70 years ago. And the training consisted in um, a series of workshops and seminars on deep listening of which this afternoon will be a slice of. Um, to listen in silence, listen without judgment um, to citizens who uh, have the courage to dare walk in, select a listener and um, speak to them for as long as they wished. The listeners sat in silence, dressed in blue, a very approachable color, um, simple indigo blue. Um, and they sat there for hours from sunrise to sunset. Um, there was no way, the exhibition, it was very important to me, um, even talking about it as an exhibition was hard, but the event, the cultural event um, was negotiated so that no one could see it. The way you see a gallery painting or sculpture installation, you either participated or you did not get to experience it. There was no window through which to look at it. You came through a medieval door, you agreed to speak, um, you came, you saw the list of listeners on a poster and the languages they managed, and you came through a door, confronted that pool of listeners, went up to them and spoke with them for as long as you wish, five minutes, three hours, 10 hours, for as long as you wish. The listener listened to you in silence, at the end of um, your speaking, the listener then had the um, prompt to say, thank you for speaking to me. I have listened to you. And then they walked you, as you see in a prior slide, in this one, they walked you out of the room. And it went on till almost midnight. And at that point, the listeners left. Um, and the next day we had a town hall meeting, not so much about what we heard or listened to. Um, and there's a difference we'll talk about this afternoon between hearing and listening. Um, but what we learned about listening in listening to society so that the conversation kept the ethics of listening, of listening to very sensitive, stories, um, very private stories, to secrets, to dreams, to nightmares, to family situations. Um, so the town hall consisted in a skill-based exchange of, um, of what it was to listen to society as a public servant, as a servant of listening uh, for an entire day, to listen to strangers, to listen without judgment, of which there had been a lot of fear. There were, had been prior to this event, a lot of fear. Well, what if someone tells me that they're from here getting up to go and commit suicide? What if they're going, telling me that from here they're going to go and kill their wife? What if they you know, tell me something uh, that is 
um, they're committing a crime. They have committed a crime or about to commit a crime. So there was a lot of fear about listening, about the content of listening. And, um, and my argument throughout was the service is to listen in silence. There are millions of people walking around the world feeling unheard. And many of them actually have access to teachers, priests, rabbis, um, counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, and so on. Many of them do, and, and family members and friends. But what they need is someone to listen to them without interrupting them, without an agenda, without judgment, to release. Um, and so it's fascinating during the town hall that people, some of the people who have been the most adamant about wanting to speak during the listening sessions um, said, you know, I, I, was, I was really doubtful of this dynamic, but I heard so many things for which I was not prepared and had no skills and no information and no knowledge with which to answer. Um, that I was grateful for my silence. I was grateful for the mandate of being silenced, of just being a vessel that encompassed this enormity of life, of individual and family and social life. Um, and we can talk about that during the conversation. And the listening school and the listeners uh, was through the River to River Festival, um, sponsored by the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. Um, and we started with, uh, once again, recruiting a group of citizens, artists, non-artists, walking the city together as a group, uh, talking about concepts, about neighborhoods, um, visiting different buildings where we might cite listening, um, and then visiting the Federal Hall National Memorial where George Washington was sworn as first president of the United States. And this is during the Trump years. So this was a very intense place in which to come and listen when we, while we felt there was a crisis of democracy in the US to come to this place that is part of the mythology of American democracy to sight listening here. Um, and, um, and again, to talk about what did it mean to listen there um, for an entire evening to the, to the New York community. Yeah, got it. Just a, a second of, of us being there in a very real way. And then um, after doing that preparatory work, which included workshops, not just walking the city and talking, but sitting down to, to a series of workshops over several weeks about listening, uniforming the listeners with a badge. You know, we are a society where fewer and fewer people wear uniforms, usually the lower ranking work, uh, jobs um, in our society, um, janitors, until recently, nurses were not deemed as important until the pandemic hit. And we saw how important nurses were to our healthcare. Um, and then unleashing this wonderful group uh, of listeners um, throughout New York City uh, for three days to research listening. Now talking with pedestrians, uh, blurring the language uh, of performance blurring the event, the performative event with the research towards the performative event. So that in, for many people and some of the you know, listeners themselves, this was the real event. Spending three days on the streets of a city, listening, claiming being a listener, the responsibility of saying, I'm a listener. Imagine walking around with a sign that says listener the kind of responsibility it puts on you just on a regular day, you know, rather than suddenly coming out of the closet and saying, hey, I'm a listener, and then going back in, you know, for, 
So, so exposing them, you know, the vulnerability of that, um, all of us, myself included, with a longer beard, and um, you know, in Manhattan, and and talking with them about listening and getting that out of your body because the listening we were going to do was in silence. So getting all that, you know, having society answer your questions about listening, not an expert, but going around asking people, what is listening to you? Do you feel listened to? Who is the best listener in your life? What constitutes a good listener? What, what are the listening skills? And having society answer that to you as an artist, not another artist, but pedestrians. And of course, it's very intimidating. Like, you know, it's not quite like sitting on a train and having this passenger um, there as your subject, victim, what have you. And, pouncing on them to ask them about listening. This was walking around and stopping people in a city where everyone is running and saying, good morning, I'm a listener. Um, I have some questions about listening. Would you care to talk to me about your notions of listening? I mean, that is incredibly intimidating, you know, to young people, to young uh, civilians and artists. So. Again, bridging that gap of what constitutes social practice, not the theory, not the theory of it, but the practice, the immersiveness of having to stop someone who's not in a museum or in a gallery or in a contemporary art center, who's in the street, on the street, on their way to work, on their way from work, having lunch, what have you, just taking a stroll and engaging them. Three days of that. And then going back to this place that was so heavy with history and staging a listening circle for one entire evening where pedestrians who knew about the festival, who were walking by and saw signs, who were part of you know, the community, um, entered through the passageway. Um, in this case, I was the um, enabler, the facilitator. I walked them through um, this hallway to the circle where they picked a listener and spoke for as long as they wished that evening. And this is the only photograph we have because I try not to consume my own audience. You know, not only am I doing ephemeral work, um, and of course, all I have is documentation, but even in the documentation, I try not to consume my audience. Um, so this was the moment right before the process started. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, today I want to share a few thoughts about the therapeutic effects of feeling heard for those who have experienced troubled times, whether uh, at the front lines of the pandemic or in the kind of anguish and sorrow of their everyday lives. I'd like to begin with a quote by my colleague, Taya Sepinuk, who um, will be co-leading the workshop uh, this afternoon, uh, Listening Beyond Words. 
for those who are interested, um, about the psychosocial dimension of healing, which is a guiding idea, kind of a foundational idea behind our work at the Penn Medicine Listening Lab. Her words help us envision a role for the arts and the humanities as a form of care, one that, um, like the social and the biomedical sciences, can help us um, kind of envision a way that um, the arts and humanities can contribute to the complex matrix, a complex matrix of things that impacts healing. At some point in life, everyone experiences profound suffering and loss, whether directly as a patient or in their capacity as a family member or a friend, a caregiver or a clinician. Family and friends often experience fear and helplessness in the face of a loved one's suffering. In medical settings, staff and clinicians may be overwhelmed with feelings of responsibility and the limits of biomedicine to cure every disease. Yet, like many of us, they're often socialized to hide this vulnerability and to, to not seek emotional support. So in these difficult moments, the listening lab offers people an opportunity to express their emotions and their experiences in the form of stories and to know that they're being listened to and heard. This process encourages individuals to translate their experiences into a new narrative form one that connects the storyteller and the listener and reveals uh, their shared humanity. At the Listening Lab, we consider listening to be a profoundly social and a dialogic act, uh, one that helps us bear witness to the intensity of suffering in our lives and in the world, but also the search for meaning and ultimately joy that is central to the aspirations, I'd argue, of both medicine and the arts. So the Penn Medicine Listening Lab is a media platform and it features short stories of six minutes or less by patients, caregivers, staff, and providers. Although we've produced over the years several exhibitions and publications and other outcomes, it's fundamentally and kind of an online portal uh, as a storytelling initiative that embraces the simple act of listening and sharing and advocates for the power of listening as a form of care. And as a gathering place for stories from all across Penn Medicine, the Listening Lab affirms and it celebrates listening as essential to the work of healing. Over the past several years, the invitation to share a story with us has led to a wide diversity of voices being featured, including those of physicians and nurses, caregivers and patients, chaplains, call center staff, redcoats, social workers, home care workers, and more. All story types are welcome. And the archive features at this point around 50 first person narratives of lived experience of disability, sexual assault, COVID-19, racism, and many other issues. In recent years, these stories have been listened to within the health system, both individually and in group settings, well over 30,000 times. And we, we will remain immensely grateful uh, to the, the many individuals across the health system who've really bravely shared their stories and their lives with the community in a very public way. And in allowing themselves to be vulnerable in public, which is very different than doing so in private, they've given a gift to the entire health system. So as a way to illustrate the work at the Listening Lab, uh, I wanted to share today a couple of stories from the archive. And I want to begin with a short three minute excerpt from a story by Peter Matthews. Um, he also, he actually tells the story with his, with his daughter um, in the full version. Uh, and the story is entitled My Second Life. And as you can see, we recorded it just uh, unexpectedly, unknowingly, just as the pandemic was about to, to begin. Um, and in the story, Peter has just unexpectedly received a life-saving organ transplant that he hadn't anticipated having a chance to receive. And uh, this is an incredibly profound experience for him that makes him newly aware of his connection to the now deceased donor that enabled him to live. Uh, but it also helps him chart a new path in life. And that's one that's shaped by this intense desire to make the most of his second chance. Then one day, after a few weeks, as I floated in and out, I saw someone before me. 
I couldn't make out a face, and then I heard a soft voice and realized it was a young man. And I could make out an outstretched hand, and somehow he knew I was an Aussie, and he said to me, Here, mate, this is for you. To this day, I'm certain I heard his voice. Later that day, the medical team told me that a liver was available. And then a few weeks later, I asked my team about the donor, and I was told that identities are withheld. And I said, can you tell me if it was a young man? Yes, it was. From there, everything moved really quickly. I had the transplant. Not long after that, my life changed forever. I'm trying to live a life of gratitude and purpose. I'm trying to make my life count for something. I'm also trying to live for the kid because um, I really do think I'm living for two people. When I feel joy at just breathing, I, I struggle with survivor's guilt. I've learned that this is a real palpable thing that's experienced by many organ recipients. My guilt has two sources. First, for the young man, for me to be speaking to you, he had to lose his life. Second, because I was transplanted ahead of so many others, so many who'd been waiting for a long time. I think the only way I've been able to deal with it is to have a purpose in my life. I sometimes feel the young man in me. He's close to me. He's going to grow old with me. I hear my breath going in and out. I think that's when he talks to me. I swear I feel it's just under my rib cage. I get a little something and he's trying to get my attention and then some days when I have a little problem I'm trying to fix and I say yeah kid what are we going to do about this it's really hard to express how I feel connected to this young man I don't know much about him I think about the life he lost all I can do with my second life is live it in a way that would make him proud. So when an individual like Peter reaches out to the Listening Lab team with a willingness to share a significant life experience, we begin by getting to know them. Um, and then we conduct a, brain a brainstorming session together to help give it narrative form. And then that's followed by a facilitated recording session and an, an intensive editing. Um, we seek the storyteller's consent several times throughout this process. And we also ask if they prefer to remain anonymous. We recognize, we do this because we recognize that their perspective on sharing may be changing throughout the process, may be changing. Um, through the process of sharing as well. And later after the editing process is complete, we strategize together around how to release the storyteller, the sto release the story with the storyteller and with the full team and how best to integrate this incredibly precious and vulnerable narrative into the daily operations of a very busy health system. And it's nearly 44,000 employees. So once the story is released into the public realm, we often stay in touch with one another and we reconvene quite often uh, as well from time to time. So in this way, the Listen Lab has become for us, for all of us, we're part of it, a unique kind of social organism that uh, weaves together the lives and the experiences of patients and caregivers, staff and providers, individuals who are you know, often separated by incredibly significant and pronounced power differentials that often struggle to hear each other um, in the most basic of ways. The projects also become in this way a sort of seismograph um, that's constantly responding to the individuals, the issues that individuals and communities are facing, 
the issues that are the defining issues of our time. And in listening to these stories, our community is, we hope, developing a greater capacity to see and to understand the intersection of their, ex their experiences, their lived experiences, and the oftentimes mysterious connections that bind us to one another. So because sharing stories often elicits vulnerability, the storytellers and we as facilitators often experience deep moments of emotional connection. And you probably had one yourself as you were listening to Peter's uh, excerpt. This becomes for us the first line of listening and often models the sense of affirmation and empowerment that comes from having one story witnessed. Once the story is made public, the sense of being witnessed ripples outwards. And storytellers connect in their vulnerability with the broader Penn Medicine community. And this sense of community and connection that this entire process engenders is as important to us as, as the recording itself. So our work at the Listening Lab builds upon key tenets of narrative medicine, um, which you're, if you're not familiar with, I encourage you to learn more about. It's an extraordinary way of thinking about the intersection of the humanities and medicine that was established um, many years back by Dr. Rita Sharon at Columbia University. We've also been inspired and really marked um, um, in deep ways by the work of scholars such as Arthur Kleinman and Arthur Frank but also many conversations that we've had on this campus over the years with a wide variety of, of psychiatrists and cultural medical anthropologists, ethic, medical ethicists, historians of science, um, humanistic ethnographers such as Joao Biel and Lisa Stevenson and here at Penn, uh, Kristen Godchi, among others. And all of them have taught us how empathy and connection um, may be enhanced by receiving an individual's concerns and experiences in a story context. And in our work as well, we found that listening to another story is often uh, transformative and therapeutic for the listener opening oneself to stories about someone else's lived experience can help them gain a new perspective as well as become inspired by their own strength and their own resilience. And in this sense, the experience of listening to another story can be a threshold that helps us reflect on our own lives and and our possibilities for change. So I'd like to share one more story with you. Um, and for those of you who come to the workshop, we'll be listening to, to many more. Um, but I want to make sure that my words were accompanied by the words of the storytellers that are at the heart of, of everything that we do. So there's a, another three minute excerpt. It's by Anita McGinn Natali. And it's entitled The Good Face. Um, like Peter, Anita is a member of a patient and family advisory council at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And, um, and she's also a caregiver. Her husband received, uh, and received care at Penn Medicine. And in this excerpt, she tries to reassure him as he struggles with deep and profound uncertainty and anxiety following a surgery that has altered his face. And if her story speaks to the lifelong commitment of caregivers, um, it also reminds us of the, the relational nature of our own identities um, and how our self-worth is often dependent on someone else's presence and affirmation. My husband was not interested in seeing his reflection until about five days later, he requested that the nurse bring him a mirror. Now this surgery meant that my husband had a tracheostomy and a tube in his nose for nutrition. So he was not able to speak and communicated to me and his nurses by writing down what he needed or wanted. So the nurse brings the mirror to him and she says, are you ready? And he shakes his head, yes. He holds up the mirror. And when he saw his reflection, his whole face, his countenance completely dropped. And I panicked because my instinct was, how am I going to fix this? How can I make him feel better? I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. 
but he was horrified by his reflection. And he took a pen, wrote down on a piece of paper very angrily, I look like a freak. And it broke my heart. The nurse saw this and she said, you're right, it doesn't look good today. But every day it's going to look better and better. Years later, my husband still looks in the mirror and will say to himself, I look like a freak. His face has completely changed from what it was prior to these surgeries. And instead of saying, no, you look fine. I say, Clark, it's not the same face you had, but it's a good face. So what does it mean to say he has a good face? I understand that in that moment, he's looking in the mirror to discern his own worth. But he's also looking into my face to see reflected back what I see. stories that Anita and so many others have shared with the Listening Lab, they provide a human dimension to often very abstract concepts um, like equality and justice and even community. And, and in so doing, they help us challenge uh, some of the most pressing inequities in medicine and, and in society. So one of our goals has always been to like, destabilize the traditional ways in which people are heard in healthcare uh, and, and to support um, processes that democratize who gets to speak. Um, with this in mind, we've encouraged contributions and received contributions of stories from environmental service workers, from transporters, from call center staff, and, and many others who who uh, often not felt recognized as equal members of the care team and their stories are a way to work through that and to communicate that um, to the, the, those that they work alongside and under. So the concept of community that we're highlighting in the work then is, is one that recognizes the capacity, ever, of the capacity of everyone ultimately to facilitate healing. And yet, even as I say all this, we, we all know, we're probably all here today because we know that listening is oftentimes not a pure act and it often causes harm and injury as well. When we listen to those who struggle to be heard, what we often hear is a reflection of systemic and ideological apparatuses, um, as well as cultural biases that, that govern and profoundly shape our work, our thought, our everyday lives, our routines, and the way that we interact with each other. And institutions and those who wield power in society have historically and to this day um, co-opted listening practices typically um, to advance their own interests and to defend themselves from critique and to inhibit the structural change that we're all yearning for and so hungry for and needing. Ethically fraught as it may be at times, listening nevertheless remains an absolutely essential starting point for all of the societal um, and institutional transformations that remain so elusive um, in spite of the COVID pandemic and the racial justice awakening. Listening remains I think always is and always will be a potentially transformative and a subversive practice. Um, one that enables us to ultimately build across the many differentials that continue to divide us, new relationships of solidarity, of collaboration, of vulnerability and of, of compassion. These relationships are arguably now more vital than ever um, in the wake of these troubled times and times which have profoundly challenged all of us to care for and with one another anew. Uh, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much. Well, thank you both for those reflections and sharing um, 
your really powerful work. I have a, oh, I forgot my phone, sorry. This is how we're gonna get questions from the live stream audience. All right, so I have a few questions. Oh my goodness, it's almost one o'clock. Um, I have a few questions that I'm gonna throw out there. Um, and one is, has to do with the similarities and differences in uh, the way you're positioning your practice, right? You both talked about um, listening as creating kind of vulnerability in public, we both talked about, um, you know, listening as a form of care, um, listening as a way to, to or listening as um, an experience that's social or dialogical or relational. And I don't think those three things are the same, but you know, I'm gonna lump them together for, for now. And, um, you know, what seemed different to me in a way was um, had to do with an intention for, for the listening, because as you're listening, you're intending to share, as is the speaker. And as you're listening, or as the people who you're working with or training are listening, that, that is not the intent. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you all to talk a little bit, each of you, about that. You know, what does the listening do? And what is the listening meant to do? And how do those different intentions shape the kind of um, impact or experience that you are creating? Um, as I said, when I opened um, my short presentation, I mean, troubled times, what are my troubled times? And um, so I'm listening within, from within the art world through a medium. Um, um, I am listening from within the art world, an art world that I have been a critic of, um, thinking that it is often very narcissistic, um, that we have a heritage from modernism, a kind of perversion of modernism, not that modernism is perverse, but that, that, um, that um, limited art to self-expression, um, the self-expression of the inner life of the artist, which is very important insofar as the artist is a representative of humanity. Um, but I'm trying to, bring the art world through a series of uh, listening workshops and um, listening performances to a point of reopening to society. So it's, it's my field. It's like I'm responsible for my field. And in so doing, I am trying for my field to reconnect with society. Um, and in bringing um, artists to society, I see them transform. I train them as listeners, as deeper listeners, non-judgmental listeners. Um, and I trust the process. I trust that, as Aaron said, that the stories move you, transform you, change you, help you grow, and ultimately become content um, to the artwork you may make beyond this listening performance or this listening school. So for me, um, the listening events are training grounds for cultural producers, even as they also allow society, the society that I meet as I'm commissioned to come to a city and listen to that city, whether it's Honolulu or Philadelphia or New York, there's no question that the people who walk through that experience, experience release. And um, I always tell the anecdote that in Germany, for example, it happened quite a lot that people walked into the room, they saw that we managed 13 languages, um, the, this group of listeners, 
and they repeatedly chose listeners who did not speak their language and sat with them. And, I, and, and this happened to me, uh, people who sat with me and said, you don't speak German. And I said, no. Um, and I only, you know, I didn't say more, but I only speak English, Spanish, and French. And so I said, no. And she said, I've chosen you because you don't understand what I'm going to say. And then she went on to speak for an hour, to cry, to sob, to speak very dramatically. And then in the end, she said, thank you. I needed to let go of that, but I can't reveal it. And so I felt that I was being well used. And that was the whole point of me there as a servant of listen. For someone who is gathering the courage to eventually perhaps tell the world about a situation of abuse, of trauma, of whatever is going on in her life or has gone on in her life. And she was practicing with me. She was letting it go. I, I was being her catharsis. And perhaps after that, because I do trust the process, she will eventually go and seek someone who actually speaks her language. Um, I know enough about human behavioral psychology to know that you learn in stages. Liberation comes in stages. Growth comes in stages. It's, it's, it's ignorant to expect that someone will just come and dump at you all they carry and that you will have everything, every answer for them. You know, so, so I place artists at a point of learning to reopen the art world to society. And I place these artists at the feet of society to release something that may, they may not have been able to release with their minister, their priest, their rabbi, because they might have felt judged. And I let go. Um, it's true, I don't have an archive. I think that is, it's a beautiful archive. I don't have an archive. I mean, I've made peace with the ephemeral, with providing experience and only experience. I'll try to quickly speak to this question. And I have such respect for everything that you're doing in this. So this is not a, um, uh, in opposition to anything that you said, yeah. just a compliment. Um, you know, in, in our work, we've thought about listening as occurring at different scales. There's listening at the individual level, at the interpersonal level, and at the communal level. Um, at the individual level, we're trying to think about it uh, therapeutically. How, how does listening therapeutically serve? Um, how, does, how, do, you know, how does feeling listened to therapeutically help and assist um, the sharer? Um, and particularly in healthcare amidst the pandemic, when healthcare professionals are so feeling so isolated, so exhausted, burnt out, and um, alone, and um, and so we position the project. We've integrated into mental health kind of support and resources, and really tried to think about how it is a support for people who are profoundly struggling as caregivers. Um, um, you know, at the interpersonal level, we are trying to um, change how care is like given and received. We're specifically thinking about the clinical encounter, those. 14 seconds that usually transpire before you're interrupted um, as a patient. And like, how can caregivers, uh, clinicians, nurses, and other professionals like care with greater compassion? How does listening, has developing a greater capacity to listen impact that, that clinical care? Um, you know, the conceit is that people do not just want to be cured, um, they also want to be cared for, and that one can do both of those. Um, one doesn't have to sacrifice care in the pursuit of cure. Um, and then third, um, at the communal level, um, like we are, um, we're trying to kind of augur forth like a, an organizational transformation. We're trying to think about how do you integrate listening into, a, into an institution, into a health system, and how, how can narrativity be a, be a, a force for cultural change um, that, that unwinds all of the ways for decades people have been socialized. I mean, this goes back to Ernesto's comments about in the, about westernized thinking and how do we resist the ways we've been colonized, our mind has been colonized. How do we resist the ways we've been socialized by our disciplines, habituated um, to not listen um, um, to individuals? So um, 
Amen. Just to say one other thing. I mean, although I'm also formed by the arts and the art world, um, you know, over the years I've grown um, ever more increasingly dissatisfied with the discrete fiction of the artist, the idea that the artist creates alone, that, that creativity has to be ultimately attributed to just one proper name. And so um, our work is not an art project, but it is artistic and it is ultimately one that's arguing for creativity as a communal kind of effort. Um, and kind of, you know, I was thinking as you're asking your question about like Ant Ant uh, about uh, Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks and the distinction he makes between the organic intellectual and the professional intellectual. And um, like in the Listen Lab, we're arguing that these individuals, um, many of whom have never had a public platform to speak, that they have extraordinary wisdom and power and resilience in their lives that can be of profound impact, not just for a health system, but for other individuals who are struggling through in their own grief and, and you know, challenges. And that we have to like celebrate these individuals who have not you know, been invited to give these kinds of talks and um, who have been given the confidence of, to speak publicly through invitation or other support systems. Um, and really just to celebrate these kind of unsung heroes. And so, so that's also this guiding spirit that I think Ernesto's work also shares. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of you, I mean, I think of me as educating artists and trying to um, undo the, sculpt, the culture of spectacle. Um, and I think of you as educating doctors and trying to undo the culture of hospital. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm mindful of time, I realize, but um, I have a couple little things that I just want to put out there. And then, I mean, I was going to ask about listening versus hearing and the different sort of levels and moments and stages of listening and hearing. I was going to ask about silence versus quiet, um, because I think that's an interesting distinction there. But I think I'm just going to um, instead uh, ask one more thing and then turn to some of the questions from you all or that have been coming in. Um, so, you know, the title of the event is something you kind of riffed on at the beginning, right? Um, so you asked us to consider, and I guess you will be asking your workshop participants to consider what constitutes your troubled times. But I wanted both of you to think about how does listening trouble time mm. um, in whatever way that hits you. I could elaborate, but I'm just going to let you all do that. In what ways does listening trouble time? And you mentioned very yeah. specifically one yeah. aspect. Yeah, I mean, I'll just. Um... Yeah, you know, I think in both of our work, we're thinking of listening as a dialogic move, um, which is to say that one's life is shaped um, through the act of, like through the act of listening to somebody else. Um, you know, one's identity isn't fixed. Um, um, one's relationship to the kind of the time ahead um, can be profoundly impacted and, and transformed by, by, by the experience of listening to and receiving and honoring and witnessing somebody else's story. Um, in my own case, these stories, um, they haunt me, they stay with me in the middle of the night, I wake up and uh, worry if I've honored, honored them and shared them. Um, the stories inhabit my waking life and my sleeping life, my dream work. And I think they do for many of the people who have shared and been part of the work. Um, so um, they've totally transformed my relationship to time, to all of my other relationships in my life, um, the stories ground what I want to communicate and share with others. Um, I ground my relationship with my family. My family kind of is part of this process in some sense because it's all it's shaping them just as it shapes me. So, um, so I don't know if that's an answer, but it's it's totally transformed how I think about everything else that I do outside of the encounter, um, and even like very intimate things about like where I find meaning in life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting because you said you don't have an archive, but I think what you, I, I, I heard you say that and I thought that's not true. And then what you're saying now, of course, it lives in your body. So there mm -hmm. is an archive. Mm -hmm. It's just not a recorded right, archive. Right, right. Right? Um, um, but yeah. Um, I, I think listening 
troubles the times because the times are still in the hands of empire, of colonial powers. Um, there's nothing more threatening to empire and colonial power that you and I listen to each other rather than listening to the agenda of empire and colonial power and notions of a superior race, a superior economy, a superior landscape, uh, you know, landscape, a superior culture. Um, you know, right, the minute that I diverge from listening to that, to the agenda of, you know, a certain kind of power coming from the Caribbean. I mean, I flew 2,000 miles to be here across an Atlantic, the Atlantic Ocean. And the islands are right now boiling, you know, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Haiti, um, Jamaica, you know, um, trying to decolonize themselves as they can, how they can. And, and what threatens the times in the hands of those who own the times is our listening to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So before well, you do, let me for oh, yeah, the people please, please, who are please. watching, um, um, <clears throat> what Anissa is asking has to do with the process, um, what it means to sit and listen to a language you don't understand, and to not respond um, necessarily. And she said that um, it feels to her that that reflects a kind of agnostic approach to social transformation and social change, as nothing is necessarily done with the listening or as a result of the listening. And she wanted to hear Ernesto respond to that. Right. Um, first of all, remember that this is all I did. This is all I did. And I said I was here. So then someone who could have chosen you chooses me. I'm chosen by that public. You know, I did not choose the lady who did not, you know, whose language I did not speak. She chose me to release something. So I'm not using her, and I say this with, with a big heart. You know, I, th I think your question is fantastic. I'm not using the public as material or as a guinea pig. Um, for the education of the artist from a purely, you know, formal way. Um, I do believe in form. I'm not a social worker. Um, I am an artist. I am in the business of creating metaphors with meaning that lead to consciousness, to the making of culture, conscious culture. Um, so in that sense, I believe that listening is a politics of its own. I believe that to simply offer the act of listening is not, as you said, doing nothing, but it is doing something enormous um, that, that you know that's, that you in a, in, an, in, a, in a dynamic where it's free, <laughs> You know, it's, you'll have to pay for this. Um, where it is, as long as you want it to be, there's no constraint of time. Um, and of the tone you want it to be, you can scream, you can cry, you can laugh, you can, you can sit and be silent with me. And there were people who sat and they simply were silent with another body. So I do think that there's a gift being given um, um, but it is not um, to be measured, um, you know, through accounting or some other kind of discipline. It is actually an act of faith, um, an act of faith that you offer the body of the artist to society, and that society will pick it up and use it for whatever it needs in terms of release. Um, 
In a way, it's a question of um, where one would locate the meaningful transformation, right? This isn't a teleological revolution. It's a it's well. A, I, I'm it's the internet. Yeah, in I'm. I'm trying not to manipulate the public. You know, I'm trying not to make the public go and do this and go and do that and you know play with me. I am simply, you know, from a contemplative point of view. Um, actually, through a monastic tradition, through um, all kinds of traditions that engage in, in uh, contemplation as a notion, Sufi, Buddhist, Hindu, what have you, simply um, create the aestheticized act, you know, as a, as a form of cultural expression of placing a body there for society to come and release itself. Um, and if no one, no one forces anyone to come and do it, and you have choices from a group of listeners, um, and it is utterly confidential if you, know, if you read the curatorial text at the entrance of the event, um, so to me, there is value in that, but in fact, it's almost um, a mystical value in so far as I believe in humanity, the humanity of, of what, what this artist is capable of doing and the humanity of that society, which seeks to remain human, even though it, the economy makes it robotic. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to say one very quick thing. You know, we often, um, just building upon what you're saying, we often think of listening and, and, and speaking as speech acts that require language, language and verbalization. But there are so many ways to listen in embodied ways that do not require verbalization and do not necessarily occur just through language. Um, and in the stories that I, the excerpts of, that I played for you, yes, they were like, they were stories that were verbalized and they were entrusted to you and hopefully will impact you and resonate with you. But the reason I really shared them here was that within those stories, there are many modalities of listening that are occurring and being modeled that do not just occur through language, right? Uh, uh, a donor recipient who hears through his organ, <laughs> uh, you know, in a very spiritual sense, I kind of hear somebody else speaking to him, um, but not in language. Mm -hmm. um, or someone who needs to be comforted about, you know, how he looks, how his, how his likeness has changed, but that comfort doesn't just occur through words that the caregiver or the wife expresses, but also mm -hmm. through the reassurance that she, through her presence, mm -hmm. through her accompaniment, she conveys. So, so yeah, listening and speaking and storytelling, these aren't just linguistic acts. Right. I mean, I had a, I've had so many um, docents who manage, you know, the listener's moment outside of the hall or the room come and say it to us later, oh, so-and-so felt um, that the listener understood them and forgave them and so on. And what I watched was that the body language that you started like this, and then the, you know, the speaker came and began to speak to you. And as the story unfolded, the body language began to change, you know, shift. And I saw listeners at the end holding somebody's hand which was not part of a choreographic menu that I gave out, uh, but that happened organically as it must happen. I mean, the, a piece that is based on listening must have a flexibility to encompass the unforeseen. And so I saw, you know, the formal body language shift and then empathize non-verbally, a body empathizing with body and even touch and, um, and then exit, you know, and so there is this huge nonverbal um, um, dimension that we are actually losing to technology <laughs> by the mile, by the minute, you know, because the body is left out of most of our current exchange. Yeah. Okay, on that note, um, one can participate in an embodied way in either of the two workshops that follow. Um, there are snacks 
out in the on the table um, close to the door where you came in so that you can have something to eat before running in what is now a very small break to to the workshops. Um, I want to thank Leah and Leah and the Padilla program for organizing this fantastic event. It's been my pleasure to work also with Jackie um, and the Stuart Weitzman School of Design and the Center for Film and Ethnography and Western and Aaron um, to have this discussion. And I'm sure additional questions will be raised in the workshop and we will continue to listen to each other. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you.